I wrote this little ditty. It's called The Ballad of Thaddeus Stevens. Men of iron, men of steel, helped to turn the wheel at the ironworks that he owned just west of town. It helped the times and eased the fears of all the mothers who had tears by bringing heat to every schoolroom then around. He'd been in Gettysburg for years, speaking wisdom and easing fears, doing good things for many people in the town. Just a common man, they say, he proved it every day, leaving a legacy in the future, men would say. They'd say Thaddeus believed that learning was the answer to people's troubles, and he knew if he could educate and solve folks' need for learning, it would help fulfill their dreams and their yearnings. Club foot and hope and a staggering life of work gave Thaddeus his ability to propel. As he began to gain through a lifetime of pain, being called the devil's child misunderstood. But you see, he really knew his part by following his heart in that capital city we call Washington. He helped pass laws that set men free, but did anyone ever see it was Thaddeus who would illuminate our minds? When I look around today, I understand why people say it was Stevens who would help the common man. I see a classroom or a school, they further mankind evermore. I see Thaddeus Stevens smiling at the door. You see that Thaddeus believed the learning was the answer to people's troubles and he knew. If you could educate and solve folks' need for learning, it would help fulfill their dreams and their yearnings. Men of iron, men of steel, helped to turn the wheel at the ironworks that he owned just west of town. Time is it?
boots lame, right legs in pain. What are you doing up? Simply trying to put things in order. I'm the housekeeper. That's my job. Here, sit down. Uh, you've done quite enough already. I told you I would help you organize your papers later. You've helped me quite enough. You know, I'm not talking <coughs> about housekeeping. Well, we'll come back and order, organize your papers later. Mm -hmm. Right now, it's time you had your medicine and had a rest. Oh, uh, that vile concoction. It keeps you healthy. Why, well, you look much better already. <laughs> <laughs> it's not my appearance that concerns me. It's my disappearance. Why, you're not going anywhere. What are you talking about? Oh, come now, Mrs. Smith. Let's be honest with each other. I know I'm near the end. I've told my doctors it's a pity square fight between life and death. Now, Mr. Steele. I'm under no illusions. I know I'm near the end, and I'm <clears throat> quite resigned <coughs> to it. What is it? Why, you don't seem resigned. I don't even, On the contrary. Read it. You seem rather agitated and troubled. What? Yes, you're right. I have spent so much of my life answering critics and shouting down ignorance. It seems incredible to me. I will no longer be able to fight back. Seventy-six years. Ouch! <laughs> Seventy-six years. I wonder what, what will people think about me after I'm gone. How do you think I'll be remembered? Well, you had a wonderful and important career. You were successful at law. You were successful in politics. And you made many people happy. <laughs> I also made many people angry. I have never suffered fools gladly. <laughs> Even as a child, I was, what? Excuse me, Mr. Stevens. What is it? I have a hard time imagining you as a child. <laughs> I'm sorry, please continue. Yeah. Even as a child, I was uncommonly serious and keenly aware of life's injustices. Just look at me. People always asked, do you never smile? I learned the ways of the world very early on. As a child, I had little to smile about. I learned the impact oppression has on those less fortunate. It forged my life and tempered my soul. Oh, yes. I learned the hatred and the bigotry of the world very early. But wasn't I the lucky one? I had only one club foot. My older brother Joshua had two. <laughs> Later in life, at the peak of my career, as a member of Congress, they called me old club foot. Well, they also called you old commoner, and you should be proud of it. Besides, I'm sure it will be remembered how well you overcame your disadvantages. Why, I still smile when I think of the time that woman asked you for a lock of your hair. Oh, yes. Poor dear. Not a hair on my body for decades, and she asks for a lock of my hair. I'll never forget the expression on her face 
when I took off my wig, handed it to her, and said, here, take all of it. <laughs> I wish I could have been there. <laughs> Lydia? Why, Mr. Stevens. It seems strange to hear you call me by my first name. Yes, I know. Mrs. Smith. Lydia, you've been my housekeeper for 20 years now. I should think after this long, we may call each other by our first names. To hell with what they say. Mr. Stevens. But I've always called you Mrs. Smith out of respect, and I always wanted others to respect you, too. Well, I suppose so, Mr. Stevens. Then not Mr. Stevens. Uh, come now, say it. That is. <laughs> it's not easy to unlearn old ways, proper ways. Mm, necessary ways. Yes, unfortunately. Necessary for them. <laughs> You are an exceptional woman, Lydia. I have been very fortunate with the two women in my life, my mother and you. I wish I had known her. She was an extraordinary woman. When my drunkard of a father, if you can call him a father, deserted us, she struggled to raise her four children. <laughs> a woman of great energy, strong will, great piety. She worked night and day just to educate her little <laughs> devil child. Well, it may not have been a very auspicious beginning, but look at all the success she had later in life. Yes, yeah, so it isn't as if there weren't other failures. As a matter of fact, one of my greatest victories was really one of my greatest failures. What do you mean? Oh, as a young man, I was so intent on winning cases, I did something I regretted for the rest of my life. I, I took a case for John Delaplane, a slave owner who wanted to repossess Charity Butler and her two children. Charity had run away from Delaplane years before and married Henry Butler and had two children by him, Harriet and Sophia. But Eventually, Delaplane found her and kidnapped her and her two children. To her <clears throat> distraught husband hired an attorney who argued that Charity's former master had brought her into Pennsylvania enough times that she had been there for six months, making her a free person under Pennsylvania law. Charity had meticulously Kelly, her days of frequent visits. I argued this thing all the way up to the state Supreme Court, proving under law that unless a single visit had lasted six months, Charity could not claim freedom. Well, I won, but I lost. That case turned to ashes in my mouth, never again in my life. Would I prosecute such a case? I learned early on that upholding the letter of the law can be moral error if it violates the spirit of justice. I deeply regret taking that case against Charity Butler. But it did open my eyes to the evil of slavery. Do you regret many things in your life? No, not at all. I've always felt I was on the right side for battle, except for that one case. But, of course, in the process, I have made many powerful enemies. Well, it's not surprising you've made enemies. <laughs> Your position was politically quite dangerous. Yeah, well, of course, I made enemies. <laughs> it's a wonder. <laughs> I don't wonder I survived politically at all. Even my mother tried to warn me. Lydia, she was right. Once a young, pregnant Negro woman was found dead, possibly murdered, at the southwest corner of North Washington and railroad streets outside the old 
Presbyterian Church in Gettysburg, just around the corner from my house on Chambersburg Street. Can you believe it? They accused me in the newspapers of that horrid deed. Usually, I do not respond to such accusations, but eventually I did sue one Gettysburg newspaper editor over a Jacob the Fever of the compiler. He was convicted of criminal libel and defamation and sentenced to court fees and fines, $12,000, a sizable fortune in those days, and to three months in jail. Oh, yes, I made enemies. But I guess the people of Gettysburg and Adams County believed in me because they elected me to the state legislature and sent me back six times in the next 10 years. What? What is it? I'm reminded of a story of another old arch enemy of yours, yeah. Alexander Harris. Oh, which story? Oh, you remember. You and Harris encountered each other on the sidewalk, and Harris bellowed, I never step aside for a skunk. <laughs> and you, holding your nose, strolled past Harris and replied, I, I always do. do. <laughs> what is it? There's something I've always wanted to ask you. What is it? Please promise not to take offense. Oh, Mrs. Smith, I'm more likely to give offense than to take it. What is it? That railroad you tried to spot. Oh, the infamous railroad, the tapeworm. Yes, I suppose that was controversial. Controversial? Why, you wanted to connect the Wrightsville line mm -hmm. with the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. Mm -hmm. Controversial indeed. Everyone knew it was planned, the tracks were planned to run alongside your Mariah Ironworks twice. Yes, well, you know, that's really a, a big misconception. That Mariah Ironworks was completely shut down long before the uh, planned completion of that rail line and the, the railroad had to wait 50 years because I lost political power in the state legislature. Yet I remember even when your iron mills were losing money you refused to lay off any of your workers. Well, why should they have suffered for my bad business decision? I could afford the loss they could not. Actually, it came as uh, something of a relief when I was told that Confederate soldiers under Jubal Early had made a special trip to destroy my iron forges to Caledonia. When I learned the rebels had burned down my iron mill, I asked, oh, did they burn my debts too? <laughs> well, I guess you won't be remembered for being a great iron master. You asked me earlier how I thought you'd be remembered. Now I'll ask you, how do you want to be remembered? Of all the things I fought for, that I cared about most deeply, foremost, without doubt, was my devotion to education. remember your first year in the state legislature. You defied your political party and your constituents by supporting an $18,000 appropriation for that new college in Gettysburg. I argued for the establishment of the college and helped get the money to build its first buildings and I provided the 12 and a half acres those buildings were built on and I helped found and govern the college's branch medical school in Philadelphia from 1839 to 1861. Let demagogues note it for future use and let it be carried on the wings of the wind to the ears of every one of my constituents in matters of this kind. I would rather hear the approving voice of one judicious, intelligent, 
and enlightened mind than to hear the whole loud hurrahs of the whole host of ignorance. That's what I told him. <laughs> we got our college. Stevens Hall and Stevens Run uh, among the college of the Gettysburg campus properties named after me, but my honor has suffered a little luster in the case of the stream you and I would remember as Stevens Run. With all the new development in that gracious town, it appears the run has seen little more than a trickle lately. I hear that students at the college are now calling it the mighty Tiber. And I hope when they write my obituary, they'll remember that in 1835, three years after the founding of the college, I led the campaign to save free public education in Pennsylvania. I trust when we consider to act on this question, we will all take lofty ground, look beyond the narrow space that now circumscribes our vision, and so cast our votes that the blessing of free education shall be conferred on every son and daughter of Pennsylvania, shall be carried home to the poorest child of the poorest inhabitants of the meanest hut of your mountains, that they may be well prepared to act well their parts in this land of freedom and lay on earth a broad foundation for that enduring knowledge that goes on increasing through increasing eternity. Thank you, Ben. For what? For all you've done for my people. For your people. Consider what they have done for the good of the nation and to emancipate themselves. What I have done is little by comparison, Lydia. I can't say I ever knew what it was to be in your shoes, but I do know what it is to be poor and downtrodden. You've always been such a fierce abolitionist. <laughs> and such a fierce college trustee. In 1854, Pennsylvania College eventually renamed Gettysburg College you remember, she was experiencing critically dwindling enrollment. A coalition of the college's professors and trustees quickly assumed power to pass a resolution to move the 22-year-old school from Gettysburg to York, Pennsylvania. When I learned of the scheme, I rushed back to Gettysburg, determined to oppose, single-handed if necessary, a very determined, mutinous crew of academic deserters. <laughs> I'm glad you fought to keep that little college in my old hometown, Gettysburg. It was an act inspired by providence and destiny, as later revealed by events of the Great Rebellion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is. I do give thanks for you every day for defending, not only for defending my people, but for defending my honor and my reputation. There are a lot of things that we've kept quiet about. And it took a lot of courage for you to defend me in a society that disapproved of our living together. Why, if they only knew uh, Yes, yes, we agreed not to discuss such matters. Lydia, I was never ashamed of you. You were always much more than a housekeeper. These past 20 years, you have proven to be the person closest to me, my most trusted, 
faithful confidants. For that, I thank you. Now, I think perhaps this evening we'd best speak of other things. Or perhaps it would be best if we spoke no more at all this evening. You should be asleep, you know. You have company coming in the morning. <coughs> yes. I'm sorry. Yes, I know. <coughs> should I send word that he's not to come? No, no. no. I'll see him. I think people would be surprised to know that you spend time visiting with President Buchanan. <laughs> <laughs> Old Buck. <laughs> he was never really an enemy, you know? As a matter of fact, as young men, we got along pretty well. In my Gettysburg years, Buck asked me to join his party. Of course, as a matter of principle, I couldn't do it. But, well, <coughs> one time, Buck actually refused to take a case against me. Why did you call him, uh, what was it, a blob of... Oh, a bloated mass of political putridity? <laughs> yes. And, well, he got me so damn angry. <laughs> you also said he died of lockjaw. <laughs> well, he refused to debate or even speak on important matters during the national presidential campaign. <laughs> Two confirmed Pennsylvania bachelors. Meaning? You're opposites in every way. He's a Democrat. Mm -hmm. You're a Republican. Mm -hmm. He lives uptown. Mm -hmm. You live downtown. Yes, well, <clears throat> he... my problem with Buck had to do with the Kansas-Nebraska Act. As you know, we were always poles apart on the slavery issue. But Lydia, you know also as well as I in politics, it is not good to harbor a grudge. We can agree and, and still be uh, civil. <laughs> I still say you couldn't be more opposite. Yeah. Opposites can work together for the right cause. You know how many people thought that Lincoln and I were exact opposites. But I saw us as a kind of partnership, each needing the other to keep in line. I did not always approve of the president's speed at handling things, but I supported his values. I thought the Emancipation Proclamation was long overdue. As for charity for all and malice toward none, I thought that a, a noble proposition. But I do not believe that the rebellious southern states should be permitted to get off without some retribution, some punishment, after all, how can we have no malice toward a group that systematically persecuted the Negro people and seceded from the Union? Hmm. What is it? Eh? What is it? Oh, uh, a conversation Lincoln and I once had about Secretary of War, Simon Cameron. I told Lincoln I thought Cameron was profiteering from some high prices on war contracts. Lincoln asked, you don't think Cameron would steal, do you? I replied, he wouldn't steal a red-hot stove. <laughs> what did Lincoln say? He laughed. But apparently when he told Cameron the joke, Cameron got very upset, told Lincoln he wanted me to retract that statement. <laughs> And did you? I told Lincoln, well, I said Cameron wouldn't steal a red-hot stove. All right, I'll retract the statement. Cameron probably would steal a red-hot stove. <laughs> <laughs> Lincoln said he thought I outdid him on that one. I declare, politicians, the wheeling and dealing that goes on. <laughs>
Very good audience. Thank you. Thanks. For